Welcome to the flock. Let's dive right into the concept of making solutions and dilutions within a lab setting with the calculations that go along with that lab setup. Want to see how it's done? Then stick around. Copper II chloride is a compound used for dyeing and printing textiles. It's used for pigments in glass and ceramic, a wood preservative, disinfectant, and much more. So if we wanted to know how many grams of solid copper II chloride were needed to make 50 milliliters of a one molar solution of copper II chloride, how would we do so? First, we need to know that copper II chloride is Cu with a plus two charge. That's what the Roman numerals stand for. And chlorine has a minus one charge. From drop and swap way back in the day, we know that our compound would look like this, CuCl2. Now we can figure out how many grams of CuCl2 is needed to make 50 milliliters of a one molar solution. Following our typical dimensional analysis setup with a magical line to freedom and a space for our answer, we'll put our given 50 milliliters of CuCl2 as the first thing on our line. To get rid of the milliliters, we first need to get rid of the milli part, and we know that there are a thousand milliliters in one liter. So now we can see that the milli part will certainly cancel and we'll be left with liters. We're going to use our goal of a one molar concentration as the next conversion factor in our dimensional analysis setup. We know that a one molar solution is the same thing as one mole per one liter. Now our one liter will cancel and we're left with one mole of copper two chloride, of course. To get from moles to grams, which is our goal here, we just need the molar mass of copper two chloride. Looking at our periodic table, if we add up the mass of copper and two chlorines, we get 159.5 grams per mole. Our moles cancel now. The only step that's left to do is to plug into your calculator, of course. Multiply all the values across the top, multiply the values across the bottom, and divide the two for your final answer in grams, which happens to be 7.975 grams of copper two chloride. In other words, we need to mass out 7.975 grams of copper two chloride from our stock bottle into a weigh boat on a scale in order to create 50 milliliters of a one molar solution of copper two chloride. Let's see what this looks like in the lab. Welcome to the chemistry layer. Let's make this one molar copper two chloride solution. The copper two chloride solid itself is a bluish green, and so my green screen really doesn't like picking up this color. But if we turn this bottle ever so slightly, you can clearly see the reason why I'd want to be wearing gloves for this lab. Check out these OSHA safety labels. We've got toxic skull and crossbones, an exclamation point like, hey, warning, dangerous and the dead fish in the tree. That's clearly stating that it is toxic to the environment. And as you can see here, very toxic to aquatic life with long lasting effects. So obviously we don't wanna be dumping copper two chloride down the drain. As we found out in our calculations, we need to measure out 7.975 grams of copper two chloride in order to create 50 milliliters of a one molar solution. So this is my makeshift weigh boat for measuring out the copper two chloride. I'm just going to zero that on my scale here. And here is my makeshift scupula, a uh, boba straw. And we're going to mass out 7.975 grams of copper two chloride. Now my little mini scale doesn't go to the second and the third decimal place, so we'll just have to deal with 7.9 grams of copper two chloride and hope that we're close enough. The next thing I need to do is take my masked out solid copper two chloride and add it to a volumetric flask. The reason I'm using a 50 milliliter volumetric flask is because a 50 milliliter volumetric flask is much more accurate at measuring a solution's volume. Notice this little line right here on the neck of my volumetric flask. That's where I'm going to be filling the water up to to have a very precise 
exact measurement of volume. Now you might be wondering, how am I going to get all of this solid copper two chloride into this little tiny volumetric flask? The easiest way to do that is to make a type of slurry of what's in the weigh boat and then add that to the volumetric flask. The way we're going to do that is by adding some DI water, deionized water, into the weigh boat. Just so that it can get into a little bit of a solution and make it easier for us to add it into the volumetric flask. Now I'm going to very carefully pour what I have in my weigh boat into my 50 milliliter volumetric flask. As you could clearly see, there was still some chemical left in the bottom of this weigh boat. We would like to get all of the chemical into our volumetric flask, ideally, in order to have that near perfect one molar solution. The way I'm going to do this is to rinse my weigh boat with some more DI water and add that rinse to the volumetric flask. Ideally, you want to do this a couple times until you can clearly see that there's no more chemical copper two chloride left in your weigh boat. Now that we've rinsed our weigh boat a couple times, and we've essentially removed most of the copper chloride from our weigh boat that we can visually see with the naked eye, we need to fill the rest of our volumetric flask up until that line that's on the neck in order to have 50 milliliters exactly. So it's at this point that you want to add enough DI water to get to that line, very slowly and very carefully. When you get close to this line, you're going to want to use something with smaller volume increments so that you don't overshoot it. Now remember, when you're trying to get a precise volume, you need to read it from the meniscus, i.e. from the bubble that's created due to the adhesive effects of water on glass. So you're going to want to get right down to eye level and add in little tiny drops so you can see where the bottom of the bubble is on the top of that line. Now, of course, the last thing you wanna do is shake it up, baby, now shake it up, baby. Twist and shout, twist and shout. Or, even better yet, if you have a magnetic stir plate and you have a little magnetic uh, stir rod, you can plop one of those in there and have the magnetic stir spin it around for you. That, of course, would be the best option to make sure that all of your solute is evenly distributed throughout your solvent. Few moments later. And now we have our beautiful blue, 50 milliliters of one molar copper two chloride solution. There are two ways that a solution can be made. The first method, as we just saw in the lab, is dissolving a solid and a liquid together. As long as the solid chemical is soluble, i.e. it dissolves in the solvent you're trying to dissolve it in, you can create a solution out of a solid and a liquid. Recall that the only way we know if it's going to be soluble or not is either by looking at an MSDS or by comparing the IMFs, the intermolecular forces of both chemicals. Likes dissolve likes. You also saw me use two very specific types of labware while I made this solution of copper two chloride. I used a volumetric flask and I also used a graduated cylinder. 
I use these specifically instead of, say, a beaker because they're more accurate in measuring volumes. And when I do measure the volumes in these types of labware, I always want to measure from the meniscus, the bottom of the bubble. Let's move on to dilutions. Okay, so now that we've made a solution, what about diluting a solution? If I had a stock bottle of hydrochloric acid that was 32% purity, i.e. it's about 10.2 molar or moles per liter, and I actually need 20 milliliters of one molar hydrochloric acid, how much of the stock should I take out and mix with water? This is where our M1V1 equals M2V2 equation comes into play. And please keep in mind that your V2 is actually your total volume. It's your water and your chemical together. So let's first pick out all of the information we have. We know that our initial molarity is 10.2 moles per liter. We know our initial volume is what? That's what we're solving for. How much of the stock should I mix with water? So that's our big question mark of the day. We know we're trying to make a one molar solution. So we're going to put a one in front of our M2 variable. And we know that we need 20 milliliters as our final volume. However, in our equation, we need to convert our milliliters to liters before we can plug this value in. So if we convert that, we just need to move the decimal back three spaces and we have 0.02 liters as our final volume. The only thing left to do now is plug and chug into our equation. Our M1 in this case was 10.2 molar. Our V1 is our X variable that we're solving for. Our M2 is one and our V2 is 0.02 liters. In order to get the X alone, we're going to divide off the 10.2 from both sides to yield a final X value equivalent to 0.00196 liters. Now, of course, we don't want to measure that out in liters, so it only makes sense that we would actually convert that back to milliliters for lab purposes. So we're just going to move that decimal over one, two, three, and we see that we actually need 1.96 milliliters of our stock 10.2 molar HCl. So we know we need 1.96 milliliters of our 10.2 molar hydrochloric acid from the stock bottle, and we're going to mix that with a certain amount of water. But how much water do we need in the lab? Well, remember that our final volume is both the water and the chemical together. So in order to know how much water to add, I actually need to say 20 milliliters minus 1.96 milliliters, and that'll give me 18.04 milliliters. So in the lab, I need to measure out 18.04 milliliters of water and mix that with 1.96 milliliters of HCl in order to create 20 milliliters of a one molar solution of hydrochloric acid. Let's see how it's done in the lab. All right, let's make us some one molar hydrochloric acid. Here we have our bottle of hydrochloric acid. Hopefully you can see there that it has a purity of 32%. That's roughly equivalent to our 10.2 molar solution. And also another reason why we're wearing gloves and goggles. Now this hydrochloric acid is so concentrated that when I pour a little bit out for our dilution purposes, it smells really horrible. It actually kind of chokes up your lungs and it'll fume a little bit too. So as opposed to measuring out the amount of chemical I need directly from my stock bottle like that, which would contaminate the rest of my chemical here, I'm going to pour out a small amount that I need into a separate beaker. This way, if there's any contaminants, I am limiting the contaminants to that beaker and not to my entire stock chemical. We know from our calculations that we're not going to need more than 1.96 milliliters of hydrochloric acid to do this dilution set. So I'm not going to pour a whole heck of a lot out into this beaker. just enough so that my syringe tip will be submerged and I'll actually be able to pull up the right amount of chemical that I need. Also take note that my beaker has been labeled. It's important to label everything that you're using in the lab so you don't mix up two beakers with each other. I'm also going to be using a one milliliter syringe. If you happen to have a micro pipette in your lab, however, that's a better instrument to use than a syringe. We also determined that we needed 18.04 milliliters of water to mix with our 1.96 milliliters of hydrochloric acid to give us a total volume of 20 milliliters of one molar HCF. So the next step in our dilution is to measure out 18.04 milliliters of deionized water into a graduated cylinder.
Now, I accidentally overshot to about 20 milliliters. A good thing to have on hand is another beaker labeled waste beaker. This way, if you ever pour out too much chemical, you can always just dump off the little bit you don't need and never ever put your extra waste back into a stock bottle. If you're in a chemical lab setting, you're going to probably have a waste carboy to use as well. However, having a little waste beaker at your lab work area is often useful so you don't have to keep running back and forth to the carboy. So I'm just gonna get rid of the little bit of extra milliliters I don't need. Anytime you're measuring volumes, you need to measure from the meniscus. So get down at eye level with the bottom of the bubble created by the water's adhesive properties to the sides of your cylinder or container. Looks like we've got 18.04 milliliters of DI water roughly in our graduated cylinder. Now I also have another beaker here labeled 1 molar HCl. In chemistry, we have a little jingle and it goes like this. Do as you oughta, add acid to water. The reason we do that is because if I was to take this concentrated 10.2 molar HCl and dump it on myself on accident, which happens more often than you'd like to think, it would hurt a lot. It would burn my skin and likely scar me. However, if I add my small amount of acid to water, whatever would accidentally dump on me would be diluted, so it would hurt me less. So in order to do as I oughta and add acid to water, I need to put my water in my one molar HCl mixing container, if you will. And of course, the next thing I need to do is take 1.96 milliliters of 10.2 molar HCl and add it to my 18.04 milliliters of DI water. Now when I do this, I have my syringe tip fully submerged in the hydrochloric acid so I don't pull up any air bubbles. Notice how I have the entire syringe tip submerged and I'm going to pull up the syringe till the bubble reaches that line. So again, from that meniscus, even in a syringe. I currently have one milliliter of HCl in this syringe that I'm going to add to my water. Do as I oughta, add acid to water. That gave me one milliliter, I still need 0 0.96 mils. Again, we're not measuring from the bottom of this black thing in the syringe, but the bottom of the bubble within where the chemical is. There we go. That looks about right. Now I'm just going to swirl that up a little bit so I can mix it together. If you are in a lab with a magnetic stir plate and a magnetic stir bar, you may wish to have that stir for a while on the stir plate. One eternity later. And now I have 20 milliliters of one molar hydrochloric acid. Thanks to our dilution equation, M1V1 equals M2V2. Remember, whatever chemical you didn't use, whatever's left over, never ever goes back into the stock bottle. We're going to place that in our waste container or into your chemical carboy if you happen to have one in your lab. You want to know how I got these scars? Chemistry. So the second way you can make a solution or a dilution is to add two liquids together. And it's said that if those two liquids are miscible, meaning they actually have the ability to homogeneously mix together due to their similar IMF properties, then you can create a new solution or a dilution if one of your liquids happens to be water. Now, there are actually two methods to which you can make a dilution set. The first is called a serial dilution method. This is basically a stepwise preparation 
where one dilution sample serves as the source for every next dilution sample thereafter. Of course, this introduces a large amount of error because if you started with a bunch of error at the beginning, you're just gonna propagate that error throughout all of your samples thereafter. But this is a very beneficial method when your dilution sets need to span wide ranges. So for example, we're just going to keep taking one milliliter out of each tube in the dilution and add a subsequent nine milliliters of diluent or water, if that's what you're diluting with, to each subsequent tube until you get to a very diluted sample at the end. In the second way to make a dilution set, you'll use a parallel dilution method. This is where the original stock serves as the sole source for all the dilutions thereafter. The errors here tend to be less because you're not propagating them throughout. It's not like one error multiplies into the next set itself. These have better accuracy, less error, but for a limited span because it's pretty labor intensive to keep going back to the original stock and doing a bunch of different calculations for each dilution set as you go through. So for example, if I wanted 10 milliliters in each of the subsequent dilution beakers, I would take say eight milliliters of stock here for a very concentrated one and only two milliliters of water for the first sample. The next one might only take six milliliters and water would be four milliliters, again, to equal 10 milliliters each time. The next one might be only four milliliters of stock and six milliliters of water until finally we'd end up with the most dilute sample with two milliliters of stock and eight milliliters of water. You could see how this would be pretty labor intensive in the lab. Make sure you test yourself before you wreck yourself. See if you could figure out both how to make the solution, the grams to mass out in a lab, for the following sugar and salt water concoctions. If you wanted to make, for example, 150 milliliters of 0.25 molar sugar solution, how many grams of sugar should you measure out? Additionally, if you made that solution but now needed to dilute it to say 0.15 molar concentration, what's the amount of water you would need to add to it? See if you can fill in those empty columns. And if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. In this video, we went through how to do the calculations for massing out a certain amount of grams in the lab to create a very specific desired concentration of a solution. We also performed an M1V1 equals M2V2 dilution calculation in order to dilute hydrochloric acid in the lab. You now know of two different ways to make solutions, both with a solid and a liquid, or a liquid and a liquid if they are miscible. And you know that there are two different dilution methods, serial and parallel. I hope your lab is just ducky. Till next time. No ducks, no glory.